All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about insect anatomy, and so now we're going to talk a little bit about the nervous system of insects. And so, as I mentioned in uh, previous lectures, the nervous system travels down the ventral side of the insect, and it's a little bit more in invertebrates and in insects. There's lots of ganglions that tend to control certain segments of the body in a way. We even see this thing, this kind of, here's an example of this, but not in insects. When we think about um, octopi, um, each one of those limbs often has something of a kind of a brain like structure that helps control that limb. Well, in insects, they do have something kind of similar where they have a big ganglion that really does a lot of control of that region. We do have a little bit of that in our, in our um, digestive system. There is a nervous system that kind of control, that does kind of, that controls the digestive system to a pretty large extent to the coordination of the digestive system in humans and animals and vertebrates and so forth. So you can have things that are kind of brain-like without actually being the brain in, in vertebrates. Well, in insects, they do have a brain um, and they're broken up into the, the three segments, or I think they're probably originated from three different segments, but anyway, there's three regions. One is known as the proto-cerebrum. And the proto-cerebrum is the front part of the brain that also contains the corpora pendiculata. I'm not saying that perfectly. Corpora pendiculata. An easier way to say this is this is the mushroom bodies of the brain. This is the thinking portion of the brain. This is the learning portion of the brain for insects. So that's for more complex behaviors. Then there's the deuterocerebrum and the Tritro cerebrum. And as you can imagine, each of those would have their own various duties as well. So here you can see the brain. So this would be the proto cerebrum. And then this would be the deutero cerebrum. And then this would be the trito cerebrum. So that's the three regions of the brain. And so you can see it's kind of traveling down towards the esophagus of the insect. In this case, it looks like they're using something of like a grasshopper or something. Um, this is the heart of the insect, the dorsal aorta, aorta, I don't think it's aorta, but, and then, but anyway, here you can see that the ganglion then makes up these different segments of the body. So each place you see a segment, you see a ganglion. So this is where most of, whatever learning the insect is doing and most of it's coming in this region. And so again, the insect uh, nervous system is gonna be made up of nerve cells, um, ganglion um, is made up of a bunch of these nerve cells. So this is, would be just one individual nerve cell out of the ton that would be here. They tend, if I remember right, they do not have myelin sheath, which is unusual because the nervous system of our body has myelin sheath that surrounds the axon and speeds up a nerve impulse. And it's really important for big animals like us with long axons. But insects like this with short axons, the nerve impulse is slower. But being so small, they can get away with it. Now, if you're familiar with the dendrite or a neuron, I'm hoping this is a little bit of um, review. The, there's, this is the cell body of a nerve. This is a kind of a generalized nerve cell, but they come in all sorts of different structures and shapes. And then the neuron receives information from sensory organs or the body of the insect or from other nerves through these dendrites. The dendrites um, receive information from other neurons. So they're the receiving end of things. 
then the information travels through, it's kind of electrical chemical st stimuli. And hopefully you realize it's due to sodium coming into the cell and, and so forth. We call it an action potential ultimately when it reaches the axon. But then that nerve impulse travels from the dendrites through the cell body, down the axon to the synapse. And then the synapse is a little space between nerves. So there'll be another set of nerves down here that, that this nerve cell will synapse to and neural transmitters will be transmitted across. So these are called axon terminals, by the way. So again, these nerves will all be connected to one another communicating or with the muscle cells, if it's a motor neuron and responsible for muscle contractions and so forth. Or if it's a sensory neuron, maybe associated with the antenna or the eyes, it'll be a different structure, but it'll be kind of the same idea where the dendrites are receiving information in the form of chemical, electrical chemicals and uh, neurotransmitters and so forth. And I won't go try to go too far, but depolarizing the cell by making it more positive and then sending nerve signals down to another nerve or muscles. And if there are chemicals that are released, it'll cause the muscles to contract. I actually have a uh, lecture on how nerves work um, on my YouTube channel. So if you'd like to get more information, that it is available there. And that's about as far as I want to go with the entomology class and describing it, the actual nerve impulses and so forth. Again, these are ganglia. And so ganglia are a, a bunch of nerve cells that come together. And then you can see the fibers and axons coming out from it. So again, uh, compared to humans, the nervous system is kind of decentralized. So if you think about centralized government versus decentralized government, our nervous system is much more centralized with the brain and spinal cord um, communicating commands to the muscles and tissues and so forth outside of that enteric nervous system, the, 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 the nervous system that's in charge of the digestive system. But in insects, generally speaking, the nervous system is decentralized. And so much of the body functioning and behavior is controlled by these ganglia that can be found in the thorax and the abdomen, these ganglia here. You can see that the ganglia is more complex than the thorax because it is dealing with the legs and the wings and so forth. And then the ganglia is probably more residual or smaller might be the right word. Um, for the abdomen and its segments. So endocrine system is the way that hormones are transmitted in organisms from one location to another. And so these chemical messengers might come from a set of, of tissues or cells, obviously cells make up tissues. And then that, and usually it travels in the bloodstream to distant organs and then causes those organs to respond. So like if we make testosterone um, in our reproductive areas, that will travel and cause, you know, hair to grow on your face if you're a man, or if you inject a testosterone, obviously it would make muscles and hair grow even if you're not a woman or a man, maybe a woman or something like that. My point is, is that these hormones have strong effects on other tissues and they respond to them. And so insects obviously also can make endocrine um, hormones that can travel from one organ to the rest and affect the, the state of the growth of insects and so forth. So there's different hormones that are very prominent in insects. A lot of them have to do with the growth stages and the molting of the insect. So here are some of the important hormones that we find in insects that you should be familiar with. We have ecdysone. Ecdysone is a hormone that promotes molting. So this will cause the cuticle to be removed. 
and for a new um, cuticle to form. And then insects also will produce this juvenile hormone and it usually keeps the insect in a juvenile state until it's ready to mature. So a small caterpillar becomes a bigger caterpillar through these various molts and the juvenile hormone maintains it as a caterpillar until later stages and then the hormone and gets reduced or so forth. And then it, the insect will go through complete metamorphosis into the, the moth or the butterfly or, or the beetle or whatever. It'll go through that complete metamorphosis. Interestingly enough, some plants mimic juvenile hormone in such a way that it keeps the insects in a juvenile state and prevents it from reproducing properly or at a, at a better time. So that's kind of an interesting plant defense that some plants use. But anyway, ecdysone and juvenile hormone are both made by insects for the regulation of this physiology that I just mentioned. And so this is showing you how the hormones can travel from these different glands um, and have an effect on these different tissues. So here's the prothoracic gland, the corpus, alletium, and so forth. So here are some um, endocrine centers. I don't know if we have, uh, so here we have corpora cardiacia, which is part of this area right here. So you can see it's close to the brain or in the brain. And it releases Prothoracic or prothoracic tropic hormone. So that's an example of a hormone that this endocrine center um, stores and releases. And so um, these prothoracic glands also secrete ecdysone, which again is important for molting. And then the corpora. Alita secretes, secretes the juvenile hormone. Let's see where that is, right in here. So it's right underneath the, so you can see it's really closely associated with the brain area. So here's some of the major functions regulated by neural hormones. Um, all, obviously these hormones travel in the blood. Insects have an open circulatory system, so they don't have blood vessels like um, arteries and veins and so forth and capillaries. It just floats around as a sac of blood, you know, the sac. And, um, but the heart can kind of push the blood around. So these hormones will be made in one set of tissues like I just described, and then will cause the molting to occur or dipause to occur, which is, means that it's going into the pupil state. And it might affect behavior like mating behavior. And um, it also make the cuticle harder. So there's all sorts of things it does. They control the blood sugar and fat metabolism and so forth. But basically it's a big part of maintaining homeostasis and, and controlling the developmental stages of the insect. Again, this is keeping it pretty simplified. Some of them are also antidiuretic hormones as well to help prevent the insect from losing too much water. So as I mentioned before, insects have an open circulatory system. They don't really have um, hemoglobin. And if you're familiar with red blood cells, red blood cells are sacs of hemoglobin to help transport oxygen in our blood. But for the most part, insects do not have the, that, those types of blood cells. There might be some blood cells that help a little bit with that, but most of their blood cells are immune functioning blood cells. And their blood is basically hemolymph or, or kind of a watery tissue or fluid. And so it's a lot different than ours. So our blood would have 
as you can imagine, blood cells, like red blood cells and white blood cells, as well as, um, you know, the watery fluids. Um, but in the case of insects, it's mostly the hemolymph, the waterly layer with fewer blood cells. And most of those blood cells are gonna have an immune-like function. So again, as a reminder, how do they get their oxygen? It's mostly through trachea and tracheoles and so forth. The insect heart is located on the upper back. It's called a dorsal vessel. And there's a posterior heart and an anterior aorta. So it's kind of it has these little holes and it basically is a kind of a muscular tube that will push the water, uh, push the blood, the hemolymph from the um, posterior side to the anterior side. So it's mostly going towards the brain. And as it's going through the, towards the brain, there's these little holes that the fluids are, are leaking out of called ostea. And so here's the ostea, and then this is the tube, the dorsal heart or the dorsal vessel, it's the heart in quotes. And then here's the aorta. So the blood is traveling up from the posterior side to the anterior side towards the brain. So it's pumping um, the, blue, the fluids around. But again, remember this is mostly getting nutrients around, also helps pump up the cuticle, like in the case of the wing developments, or expand their body and help get immune cells around. But it doesn't do a lot towards moving oxygen around, because remember, that is all happening with the trachea and the tracheoles, as I mentioned momentarily ago. But you can see kind of the general direction from these arrows, the way the blood moves through the body. And apparently there's also various pustile organs like found in the antenna that help to move fluids around the antenna as well. So while the heart does most of the moving of the blood, there's other accessory organs that are also helping with that as well. So here you can see a cross section, you're looking down it, you can see the digestive system, the ventral nerve cord and the dorsal heart and so forth. And so you can see how the blood's moving around a lot. So the functions of the circulatory system include nutrient transport, hormone delivery, uh, metabolic waste flushing, wound healing, and immune response, heat distribution, and temperature regulation. So that's the major functions of the circulatory system of insects. And you notice that um, oxygen and carbon dioxide aren't really part of that. That's all kind of happening through those trachea and tracheoles. So a big part of it is all these other functions that are important. Even you need to remove the nitrogenous waste that occurs from the muscles and put it in as uric acid into the waste system. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, obviously the insect comes across different toxins. They come across different uh, pathogens. And so they try to kill those things um, with, um, through oxidation and so forth. So there's different ways that they try to do that or they try to contain it so it doesn't get through the rest of the body. So they'll form a, a uh, kind of like a little cyst-like structure that holds in place. So that they try to do all sorts of defenses. So like even the way a parasitic wasp might sting a, a caterpillar and lay its eggs in it, they'll try to put a protective layer around it if they have the right genes to do so. And so he says, what's missing? Why do animals need oxygen? And so hopefully you know this from animal physiology or some other type of physiology class or cell biology maybe even. Why do animals need oxygen? 
cellular respiration. Cellular respiration takes place in mitochondria and helps in uh, making ATP. So cellular respiration is very important. So cellular respiration, again, takes place in the mitochondria. You take the oxygen atoms and um, they go through you know, glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to make a bunch of ATP. And then the insect or the animal releases carbon dioxide into the trachea or the tracheoles. Here is a flatworm, which is not an insect, of course. They don't really have a respiratory system. They actually do gas diffusion directly from their thin skin layer. So they have lots and lots of surface area in relationship to the volume of the body of the flatworm. A, as you can tell by the name, flat, um, would suggest that. And then here's our llama, one of the biggest, well, not the biggest animals, but one of the bigger animals that lives in high altitude that have red blood cells that are hemoglobin that is specialized in pulling out oxygen from an atmosphere that has less oxygen than obviously would have at sea level. But again, insects don't have, for the most part, um, red blood cells. There might be, a few, I think I've heard that there is a blood cell that might pick up on a little bit of oxygen in some organs, kind of like a respiratory system. But most insects, their respiratory system is dependent on this, what comes from the spiracles down the trachea, down to the tracheals. And so this is the insect tracheal system. This is the respiratory system the major part of the respiratory system. You know, there might be minor parts due to the blood. It's the spiracles, the trachea, and then there's tanidia, which we'll get to, and tracheoles, which are small, smaller trachea where the gas exchange takes place. So here's our caterpillar here. You can see the head, and as I mentioned before, they're not breathing through their mouth. They're breathing through these holes called spiracles. So you can see these on insects that you'll collect or catch. It's very easy to see on caterpillars. And these spiracles can open and close. So the insect was to drop into water, into water, it would actually close it, those spiracles to prevent water from entering. Or maybe it's, they're getting into a very dry environment. They might also close their spiracles a little bit to help prevent desiccation to some degree. So there's abilities to open and close those spiracles. And from there, the air will go into the trachea. And so those are the bigger air tube. And we don't really have gas exchange for the most part taking place in the trachea. And what I mean by gas exchange, I mean, Gas is coming from the tissues, but the tracheoles is where we are very thin trachea that where we have this gas exchange take place. So the tracheoles is where we have gas exchange take place where the carbon dioxide through diffusion will leave the tissues and go into the tracheoles and then oxygen that was in the air will leave um, the tracheals and go into the tissues. And so here's some more of showing how that branches. And you'll see that there's these little rings associated with it as well. And I believe those are the tenedia. I believe those rings that you see on the trachea are called the tanidia. And I'm probably butchering some of these names. And I do apologize for it. So you see those little rings, those lines are supposed to represent rings on the trachea. So you can see them here as well. And here, that is the tanidia. That's the name of those rings. 
And it's all, and what those rings do is provide kind of like st stronger areas that help hold that tubing so it doesn't collapse on itself. So they're more rigid and provide strength and st sturdiness to those rings. So air will go in through the spiracles, um, then they'll enter into this lateral tracheal trunk. And then some will go ventral trachea, some will go to the dorsal trachea, and then some will go to the visceral trachea. So you can see the dorsal this way, ventral on the bottom side, and, and then visceral towards the digestive system. And from there, the trachea will continue getting smaller, called tracheoles, which will provide the gas exchange for all the different tissues. So here you can see the trachea coming down and becoming tracheoles, and then actually providing the gas exchange with the muscles. So closely associated with it. Now let's talk about the digestive system of insects. As you can imagine, insects spend a bunch of their time eating, particularly things like caterpillars. They're really a tube within a tube. And so they're constantly eating. And let's get into some of the, the particulars about the digestive system. So if you don't already know this, animals, plants, and you, and everything, are made up of macromolecules. Macromolecules are the building blocks of life. You have your fats also known as lipids, proteins, carbs or carbohydrates. And then the et cetera is actually, should be listed or written down as nucleic acids, making up the DNA and RNA. So the major macromolecules of animals and insects and so, far, so forth are fats, proteins, carbs, and nucleic acids. So an insect will eat a plant or maybe there'll be a blood sucking insect and they'll digest something into their body, depending on what type of insect they are, whether they're predators or par you know, parasitic blood insects like mosquitoes or they feed on plants. But whatever the case may be, their digestive system will begin to break it down into the simplest of the monomers. Because remember monomers make up a polymer and so amino acids, the polymer of amino acids is proteins. The polymer of simple sugars would be complex carbohydrates. Big fatty acid chains will be broken down. So all these things that the, plant, the insect eats will be broken down into the simpler components. And then their bodies will rearrange them into caterpillar tissues using the DNA and transcription and translation, just like every organism on earth. So here is the digestive system of our generalized insect. We usually go to the grasshopper, is it? But um, they can vary quite a bit. But the basic idea is there's a tube going from their mouth. The mouth obviously is where the digestion begins because that's where you're chewing leaf materials or sucking blood. They'll travel up the esophagus, and then um, the salivary glands are closely associated with the esophagus. Those salivary glands might, will be secreting saliva often onto their food. And then the food, the, the salivary glands will have a pre-digestive effect where they can begin to break down carbohydrates or whatever they're digesting to some degree. And then the insect will eat the spit, because often they're excreted outside of the body. And then the insect will eat the leaf material that the saliva was on and digest it. It'll go into the crop. And the crop is kind of a storage area. There isn't really any digestion taking place here. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and definitely there's no absorption taking place here. That's something I really want to emphasize. So while digestion may begin and continue in the crop, for the most part, there's no absorption of nutrients yet. 
So you can almost think of the crop kind of like a stomach. You know, with our stomach, for the most part, food is not absorbed there. You might, I think there might be a little bit of water and some medicine, but for the most part, the stomach is a container that is helping in digesting the food and turning it and so forth. And very little nutrients is actually being absorbed until the food is squirted into the small intestine and, and the acid is neutralized. Insects, they have more of an alkaline environment versus an acidic environment like we do, as far as I best remember, or at least for herbivores. But basically the food will leave the crop and then enter into the midgut. The midgut is a bit like our small intestines. Our small intestines are the primary place for absorption of nutrients. While in the case of the insect, the midgut, midgut is where most of the nutrients are observed. Absorb, absorbed, excuse me, absorbed. And the nutrients are coming from the crop through the cardiac valve into the midgut. The midgut does its job absorbing as much nutrients as possible. And from there, whatever is left over enters into the hindgut. The hindgut is a lot like the large intestines where its job is mostly making the feces, or in the case of insects, we call it frass, and then secreting it out the rectum. So there's not very much absorption taking place except for water and maybe some salts in the colon. The malpighi and tubules, their job is to absorb um, uric acid and waste, uric acid and waste products in the blood of the insect. So the Malpighian tubules, their job is to function like kidneys. So they're a lot like kidneys. So they're gonna filter the blood. Remember what we call the blood? Hemolymph. And do you remember what we call the space that holds the blood? Hemocyl. So anyway, that's what the Malpighian tubules are doing. And so that they will collect waste products out of the blood and put it in through this pyloric valve into the hindgut. So basically insects, in quotes, pee and poop out their rectum. They don't have a separate plumbing system like we do. So their malpighian tubules are like kidneys and they'll absorb nitrogenous waste from the breakdown of protein or whatever, as uric acid usually, enters into the hindgut, and then whatever food wasn't digested also goes into the hindgut, and it's all exit the rectum together. Insects try to do a good job of keeping as much water as possible so they don't desiccate. It's very easy for an insect to dry out based on its size, if it wasn't for these mechanisms to protect themselves from dehydrating. Again, remember they're using the trachea and tracheals for gas exchange. That probably helps prevent water loss. You lose more water through a lung-like structure. And then the malpighian tubules and the fact that they get rid of their waste as uric acid instead of urea also helps to protect the insect from losing too much water. So I mentioned before the foregut is mostly um, where the, the initial food is ingested and the basic, uh, the basic storage and particle reduction takes place. In some crops, the crops can actually have muscular contractions that help to break down the food even further than what the mouth parts have done. There, what's you know, this ground up food will, will then enter the digestive system where the water and the nutrients are absorbed. Now here's something kind of interesting that you might not realize. Inside the digestive system, the insects form a paratrophic membrane. We can also call it the paratrophic matrix. 
It's essentially a net-like structure that's found inside the small intestines. If this insect had small intestines, we're calling it a midgut. Remember, the midgut and small intestines are analogous to one another. So they make this protective layer that's kind of like a net meshing, kind of like a sieve, so that only the, nutri the little nutrients get through. And that helps prevent the leaves and things that they've eaten from damaging the midgut, because the midgut is made up of epithelial tissues. And as the leaves go through the midgut, they could tear up those soft, weak tissues. So the insects make this tubing inside their, their intestines that provides a little bit of protection that's full of holes and pores, but provides a little bit of protection that can then allow for nutrient absorption. The hindgut um, is used for absorption of nutrients. Again, it's mostly going to be water absorption and getting rid of the waste and making up the feces that we call frass. As remember, insect feces or poop is called frass. And it's also the part, part of the body that's responsible for helping regulate um, the ions and water that the insects take in so they don't become dehydrated or over the burden with too much water. So again, this is more of a storage area and breakdown. This is the absorption. I haven't shown you the paratrophic matrix, but it's like basically a little netting inside of this midgut, and then we have the hindgut. And then we're going to talk about the excretory system, which again is going to involve the mouth piggy and tubules. It also is involved in maintaining water balance so the insect doesn't become dehydrated. And it gets rid of nitrogenous waste. Where does the insect get nitrogenous waste? It's through the breakdown of proteins or nucleic acids. It can do so um, in two different manners. I've mostly said uric acid. Most terrestrial animals get rid of their nitrogenous waste as uric acid. By the way, you realize when you pee, your blood plasma is being filtered by the kidneys. And in doing so, it gets rid of nitrogenous waste in your body from the breakdown of proteins or nucleic acids to some extent. Well, we get rid of our nitrogenous waste through urea. But again, insects mostly get rid of their nitrogenous waste either through uric acid or ammonia. If they get rid of it through ammonia, they're known as ammonia telic insects. And this is typical of aquatic insects. Ammonia is highly toxic. And so they need a water environment that allows them to get rid of their ammonia into the environment. They don't have to worry about drying out because they live in water, so they're aquatic insects. Now, terrestrial animals have to worry about drying out. So they make uric acid and they do so through um, using being called uretelic insects. And so again, these are terrestrial insects. And again, the, most of their waste is gonna go as dry little pellets that call them uric acid in with the feces and so forth. Again, the insects are filtered with what is analogous to kidneys called the male piggy and tubules. And then there's also some rectal pads, which I believe is the male piggy and tubules bending back onto the hindgut. Let me double check on that though. So you can't see it very well, but these little black hairs, and they would look like white hairs if you were to dissect an insect. This looks like really thin spaghetti noodles, and they're all over the insect. Those are the Malpighian tubules, named after the Italian scientist Malpighii. He's the one that discovered them and wrote about them first and published them. So again, they're very important for getting rid of nitrogenous waste. And so here is the midguts. And then again, there would be a paratrophic matrix inside of it. It looks like a little netting. 
and then it attaches to the hindgut, and that's where the malpighian tubules come out from. And again, their job is to function like kidneys. So the arrows represent the movement of water and nitrogenous waste coming into the malpighian tubules. So we've got water and nitrogenous waste coming in. And then when it gets to the hindgut, the hindgut reabsorbs the water and leaves the nitrogenous waste as frass or poop. So that, um, and then I think a rectal pad, I believe is when the palpian tubules are attached directly to the rectum. But the main point of this again, is if they're an aquatic insect, they're gonna release more urine um, in the way of ammonia. And the reason why they get away with it is that they're literally sitting in drinking water. While terrestrial animals will get rid of the nitrogenous waste as uric acid. Anyway, I hope that helps um, you to understand a little bit about insect physiology. We're going to take a 15 minute break and then return. Anyway, I hope you had a good one and I'll see you at the next lecture. Take care. Bye.